Hey everybody, this is Giancarlo Alino and Aaron Zaretsky reporting for Vibe 105 with a sports Vibe Talk segment where we're going to be talking about all things NHL today. To help us out, we're happy to be joined by our guest. He's a former Toronto Maple Leaf and currently co-host first up on TSN 1050, Carlo Koliakovo. How you doing, Carlo? What's up, boys? How are you doing? Oh, doing, doing great. Doing well. I see the sun is out where you guys are at, and that's always a good sign. Yeah, everything's uh, great. Great weather, finally. Uh, the winter's behind us, thankfully. But, uh, Carlo, uh, during these difficult times with uh, COVID-19, uh, how are you doing and how are your family doing? Family's doing great. Um, I am in, I, in, the, in the beginning, I always said that I really enjoyed the time. Uh, the, the extra time I got to spend with my family because, you know, during a normal schedule, I wouldn't normally be home as much. But uh, uh, if you're asking me what my feeling is today, I'm going insane a little bit. Uh, I think uh, I'm a social guy. I like getting out. I like interacting with people. I, I enjoy being around, um, <coughs> excuse me, the people that I work with. And obviously, I haven't done any of that in the last three months. So it's uh, I'm itching to get back to um obviously normalcy i'm itching for sports to get back but ultimately i want to see my friends and i want to see my family and that's uh, that's a big thing that my kids miss a lot too so we're uh we're doing great we're grinding it out uh we're trying to stay sane but uh, ultimately you wake up in the morning and the weather is uh sunny outside you know you're in for a good day and we just try to make the most of it that was my daughter screaming saying bye <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Aaron, got the first question. Uh, well, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, with sports, you know, coming back, it looks like it's slowly coming back. Um, the NHL, they are going to conclude the 2019-20 season with a 24-team playoff format. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you like the most and the, what do you like the least about this new playoff format? Um, I wouldn't say there's anything that I don't like about it. I actually love everything about it. Uh, most importantly, I love the fact that the NHL got creative here. Um, you know, there's been a lot of criticism over the last couple of years about the playoff format that they had is, you know, is how every year you're seeing somewhat of the same matchups. I, I don't like that. As a sports fan, I like seeing new. I like seeing uh, out of the box thinking. I like seeing uh, new rivalries created. And when you're seeing the same teams play each other every year, it, it creates a staleness uh, to the sport. And ultimately, um, I don't think the anything that the NHL and the players could have came up with would have, or I don't think anything they did would have would not have received criticism. And ultimately, um, I'm glad that they that they they they, they used their out of the box thinking. They got creative and they involved as many teams as possible. And uh, to me, that's what's going to be the most exciting part about this is you're going to have something unique, something we've never seen before, and ultimately something that's going to create value to the to the, the viewing entertainment where uh, you're going to see play-in games, something that we've never seen in hockey. I mean, I know there's wild card games that you have in different sports and stuff like that, but ultimately, you know, there's going to be no fans, which is going to be a different viewing experience. Uh, they're going to be based in a hub city, so there's not really going to be any home ice advantage. But um, I think you have to just, uh, you know, use common sense and understand that uh, we are living in unprecedented times. So why not run something that would be normally viewed as unprecedented? And with this playoff format of 24 teams, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I think you might you might watch some of the best hockey you've ever seen because ultimately everybody's starting at an even playing field. Uh, you'd have to think that not many guys have been able to skate. Uh, for the most part, almost every team is going to be completely healthy. So even if you had to label a favorite or an underdog, uh, it'd be tough to pick one. Yeah, because it's definitely right now everything is up for grabs. And given how last season there were so many upsets, right? Yeah. Upsets are likely to happen this yeah. season too. Well, I mean, you saw upsets in a normal format, and you'd have to think that uh, in this type of format, you're going to see even more upsets. But ultimately, I think the NHL is whole hoping, and everyone's hoping that the best teams are going to find a way to win because you want to see the best players play, you know, the the the, the longest in the format. But uh, uh, that's you know, listen, the NHL wanted parity, um, and this is the best example of it, if you ask me. And uh, one interesting thing about this format is the possibility 
uh, teams that traditionally would be in the first round of the playoffs now have to go in this playing round and if they get eliminated they would get a draft lottery pick with the possibility yeah. of a top three pick uh what are your thoughts on that see i don't know if i agree with that too much and to be honest with you my takeaway from the whole lottery explanation yesterday was very confusing and I, I don't know why it has to go to that extent. Ultimately, you should give the teams that are not participating in this playoff format the best chance for the pick because you know they're they're the they're they're the teams that nobody's thinking of right now. They've they've put themselves in that position uh, to have a better chance at that pick. And um, I don't know if I agree with the team like a like a high seed being upset and all of a sudden getting a chance for the number all, number all, number one overall pick. I mean, to me, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, ultimately, they try to they, they should have tried to, to make it as simple as possible. But, you know, nothing right now is going to be simple in any decision that they make because you're going to get, um, you know, criticism or you're going to receive feedback uh, in every decision that's made. So um, if somebody can help explain it to me a little better, then maybe I'd have a better understanding of it. But... Ultimately, I think you're going to one of the top seven teams, one of the bottom seven teams, I think are going to get the top pick. And, um, you know, it's 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 crazy to see. I mean, the St. Louis Blues could be one of those teams as well, too, if they get it. Uh, uh, sorry, no, they're 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 in the buy format. So I take that back. True, true, true. And then uh, another interesting thing, right, it's just like the round, the round robin, right, for the top four teams in each conference where. All of a sudden, that will determine the top four seeds. You yeah. play three games each, and it's like, you know, if I was like, you know, for the Boston Bruins, for example, like you were clearly the best team this season, and now all of a sudden, if things don't go your way after three games, you could end up being the fourth seed, and then yeah. it just throws, you know, so many things off. And well, to me, I don't know if I put too much emphasis into into the way that's being um, the uh, run out because. You have to find a, a, a competitive edge for those top four teams to play. And ultimately, I'm all for it. I'm all for these guys playing for something and uh, getting themselves ramped up to play a playoff-style game. And if it means improving your seating, by all means, go ahead. I, I like that idea, too, because we still don't know what type of format they're going to come out of the play-ins with, whether you're going to go back to a reseeding or whether you're going to go into a bracket style. So ultimately... You know that could still change who you're playing, no matter how you 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 decide. You know what position you want to take on the four by teams, because if you went bracket style, then you could still be playing a, a team that you probably thought you weren't going to play. And if you're reseeded, you might still play a different team that you never thought you were going to play. So, listen, at the end of the day, if you're going to win the Stanley Cup. You're gonna have to go through. You're gonna have to play great opponents, and there's not gonna be a favorable matchup in any scenario. So, um, what I hope they do um, come to agreement with, though, is listen. I, I understand that there's still a lot of um, uh, uh, restrictions that have to be lifted before they get back to playing, but ultimately. Uh, based on what they're saying, that you know they could start next season into January. So if you're going to do that, then really play this out properly and really try to keep the integrity of the game. And when I, when I say integrity of the game, I want all four rounds to be best four out of seven because there's no reason to play your first two rounds three out of five because then you're really... You know, now you're messing with the integrity of the game because you know if, if you're saying that's your playoff format, well your Stanley Cup champion is not going to have to go through and win 16 games. And if you're a team that comes out of the, the play-ins, you're going to possibly have to win 19 games, which to me, you know, gives uh, gives you a greater appreciation for what this team was, if, if this team was able to win and what they are able to accomplish. And all this talk about asterisk, like, come on, give me a break. Like, if anything, I, I would put, I would give more credibility to the team that was able to persevere through these circumstances of you know going through a pandemic not having to skate ramp itself up to play playoff hockey and ultimately if you've got to win 16 or 19 games you still to me you're still a champion uh, for those just joining us on vibe 105 this is john carlo and lino and aaron zaretsky joined by carlo koliakovo of tsn uh carlo like you were bringing it up there about the playoff format the changes 
the Leafs out of this are now matched up with the Columbus Blue Jackets. Mm. Uh, all year we've been hearing about how the Leafs have not been tough in terms of uh, different areas of the ice, in terms of grit. Now they're matched up against a team like Columbus. John Tortorella likes to coach that kind of style. Is this a bad matchup for the Leafs right away? See, I, I'm not going to put too much credibility into the toughness part of um, this sort of return to play because the way I view the hockey we're going to see coming out of this is your the, the 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 normal hockey you would see when you start a season. You know, it's going to be a lot of um, you know a lot of loose play, a lot of high scoring games, a lot of back and forth, uh, just because it takes time to build up that type of intensity and that style of play, uh, you know, cause you're not really playing a lot of that in preseason or in, in training camp and, you know, come season guys are raring to go. Uh, everybody's, you know, healthy, everybody's full of energy. And I think that's what we're going to see once this format still starts. So if anything, um, I think the Maple Leafs, it, it actually favors, uh, the, the way they want to play. Yeah. You know, John Tortorella is an experienced coach and, uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets are coming off of uh, a year where uh, they had so much turnover and they had a lot of injuries, but they also were a team in last year's playoffs that that had the greatest upset in, in hockey playoff history where they swept, you know, a record-breaking Tampa Bay Lightning team. So uh, if, if you had to give an advantage into an ex- the experience factor, I would give it to the Columbus Blue Jackets because there's a core on that group that – knows what it takes to win a playoff series, something that the Maple Leafs as an organization haven't done in 15 years. Uh, so in, in saying that, you know, the Maple Leafs are, are very skilled, very young, uh, very talented. And if, if those are the type of games that we're going to see, or especially early on, uh, you know, you got to feel good about the Maple Leafs chances. But yeah, I mean, the other thing that, that, uh, that I sort of, take out of or at least give the Maple Leafs credit for is they're, I don't believe they're going to be facing the normal pressures that they would uh, in a normal playoff series because you're not going to have the criticism of going into the playoffs of you know uh, the inconsistencies and and you know are they built good enough to is their defense good enough what's their goal thing you're not going to have any of those questions to answer because ultimately you know, no one's ever gone. No one's ever been through this 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 time that we're in this pandemic time. So, uh, the fact that they're going to be able to play loose—that's what this this team loves to do. They love to play loose. They love to display their skill. And if you get into a, a shooting match or a, you know a, a track meet with this group, it's going to be a tough team to beat. And also now, there's not going to be any fans uh, likely, maybe even player personnel, uh, staff members, if they decide to have an attendance of like uh, 20 or 30 scattered around. Do you think that will have a, like a positive effect on this Leafs team because they won't have to deal with uh, the added pressures, let's say against Boston, where the crowd was in their favor and it ended up having a negative effect on them last year in uh, Game 7? Do you think the Leafs might benefit from having no crowd? It's a, it's a tough question to answer, but I mean, I think the easy the easy answer would be yes, because there are ghosts or demons of that Boston building that don't sit well for a lot of this Maple Leafs group. But ultimately, um, you know, it's it's all about the the emotions that you create within your own locker room, and for the most part, this year, even with crowds and stuff. That's kind of the body language that we've seen from this group where they haven't really showed that emotion in a game. They've sort of needed something uh, to happen within the game for them to get. I, I've always said that this Maple Leafs team plays better when they're pissed off. And, you know, what's going to allow them to create that emotional feeling with them if there's no fans in the stand? So that's going to be something to watch. But ultimately, as a playoff you know, in general, the thing that, that, that you know, really – provides the enjoyment factor for me and for any sports fans is when you watch playoff games, it's the lead up, you know, it's the, it's the playoff or it's the player intros. It's the, you know, the, when the players come onto the ice, it's the crowd going nuts. It's the white towel waving. It's the music blaring. It's the emotions you see in players when they first step on the ice and they're going crazy and you're hearing the fans just go nuts on the broadcast or even in the building. There's not going to be any of that. It's going to be an empty feeling. So that's going to be a challenge for a lot of these groups and especially young players. You know, what are, how are they going to get to keep themselves motivated, you know, in a quiet atmosphere 
um, in a game where you can't really feed off any type of energy unless it's the energy that you create, whether it's in the locker room or on the bench. So I, I think the Maple Leafs, the fact that they're young and exuberant, that could bode well for them. But it's uh, it's going to be a, a, you know, a, an interesting thing to watch, not only just for the Maple Leafs, for any team uh, that, ha- that decides to go on a playoff run. And also, uh, just one more for me before Aaron uh, jumps back in here. Uh, now they're looking at the team. Like you mentioned, Chicago, uh, Montreal, uh, Arizona. These teams are now getting an opportunity here where they were in, like, in the playoff play, uh, race, and now they're going to be getting an opportunity. Uh, do you think a team like Chicago or Arizona, the kind of skill and uh, veteran presence they have, could they be a dark horse to win this whole Stanley Cup? Yeah, anybody can be a dark horse if you've got the right amount of veterans in your locker room. Uh, you know, Chicago's their their core group has won three Stanley Cups, right? So uh, the Corey Crawford is one of those guys that's in net. If he if he finds a way to uh, to stay hot uh, or to play to to play great, and you got leaders like Kane and, and Taze leading the way, uh, those guys can score goals. And if they get into a, a comfortable matchup. Uh, it's easy to say that they could uh, that they, they could they could find a way through, and you know the Montreal Canadiens. The tough part about those teams is, um, you know, the, the mindset uh, was was they they were sellers at the deadline, and they they moved away from some players that probably could help them at this time. But in saying that, that could also bode well for them, and you know, a team and in, in, you know with with a lot of youth and a lot of inexperience could be hungrier. Uh, to be part of this format and play playoff hockey, not your normal style playoff hockey, but uh, at least get a taste of it. And uh, ultimately, listen, I, I think every series is a flip is going to be a flip of a coin. Um, it's all about um, who has the better mindset, who's going to be better prepared, and who wants it more. You know, some guys. You, you don't really know what the what the reception is around the league with certain players, whether or not they feel comfortable enough. Uh, you know, to risk injury, to risk health concerns, to be part of this thing. Ultimately, I think the, 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 the better percentage wants to come back and play and wants to play playoff hockey. I mean, who doesn't want to, to be part of that as a hockey player? So um, it's going to be interesting. I, I think, like, like I said, the way I, the way I started this, this is going to be some of probably the best playoff hockey you're going to see in a long time because you're going to have a lot of guys hungry. You're going to have a lot of guys motivated. And uh, ultimately, it's the team that makes the least amount of mistakes that's probably going to um, have the best success. With uh, former Toronto Maple Leaf player and co-host of First Up on TSN, Carl Korlakovu, um, speaking of dark horses, um, you were a part of the 2006-2007 Toronto Maple Leaf teams that just missed the playoffs uh-huh. by two points and one point respectively. Um, if you guys made the playoffs in those seasons, uh, how far do you think you could have gone? Like, w- would you been like a dark horse? Uh, it's so tough to say. I mean, I, that, that year, um, you know, one of my biggest regrets of, of, of playing as a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs was I never got to experience what playoff hockey was like. And we were so close that year. And if we would have got in, we would have played the Buffalo Sabres and, Everybody knows about that rivalry, you know, the the QEW. And um, we actually played Buffalo really well that year. And Buffalo was a powerhouse team, and we weren't as talented. But you put yourself in a seven-game series against anybody. And that's why hockey is so great is because, um, you know, you, you, could, you could set records in the regular season of being a great regular season game. But once the, the heat gets turned up in, in, in a playoff-style atmosphere where – every game becomes a harder grind when you talk about matchups and when you talk about uh, fighting for your every inch of space. Uh, it's a bounce here. It's a bounce there. It's, it's, it's anything. It's an injury that uh, could, could, could basically uh, turn the tide in, in a series. And I think, I think we would have given Buffalo a good run, but I don't think we would have been able to beat them in a seven game series because they, I think their talent would have taken over and, uh, but uh, again, that's 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 so tough to answer because you don't know what the temperature is going to be like in that city. Is there, is there is there a blood that boils? Is there a feud that starts to develop? And you know, we've all seen those Battle of Ontario series with the Leafs and the and the Ottawa Senators in years past. 
where the Ottawa Senators have dominated the regular season and they get into a playoff series with the Toronto Maple Leafs and they can't beat them. And you know, they, they, you, you see that, you see those instances happen so many times. I think the perfect example is, uh, you know, watching a team like Columbus, watching a team like Carolina last year, who nobody gave a chance before the tournament started, but it's the way they, they bought into playing. Uh, they were going to play a hard style. They're going to play in your face and, uh, you know, they, they ended up finding different things to rally themselves around and ultimately make uh, good, you know, Columbus didn't make a good playoff run because they got eliminated in the second round, but they gave Boston a go. And uh, they definitely upset one of the best teams in the league. And um, it's, it, listen, the best time of the year is to play is in the playoffs. Um, and that's what every player b- builds themselves for with their regular season. And uh, it's it's all about who wants to go that extra inch, who's willing to sacrifice the most. And I think in this particular format, it's going to be an even, an even greater uh, importance to have that as quick as possible. Carlo? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Carlo, uh, also just talking about those teams, he played with Matt Sundin uh, near, he was like tailored towards the end of his prime, uh, mm-hmm. like the final seasons. What do you remember most of them? Like, what's a memory about Sundin? Because sometimes you hear players talk about these past legends, but yeah. being around them, like the 500th goal against Calgary and uh, just everything he accomplished as a Leaf. Uh, wh- how was he as a player and as a teammate? Matt Sundin was the best person, player, teammate that I've ever got a chance to play with. You talk about a guy who represents himself with class, real genuine, really respectful. And uh, to me, uh, as, a, as a young guy, I, I, my, my first year in Toronto was 19 years old. And the next oldest guy was 27. And uh, it could have been a really, really difficult environment for me to be in. But Matt Sundin, right from the beginning, uh, was a guy that always made it a priority to make me feel comfortable every day. Always came and talked to me. Always asked me how I was doing. Uh, was always talking to me about uh, different things that you know I could do to make myself comfortable around the boys. And uh, it's, I, I can't even describe you know how much that how how important that was to me and how much it meant to me. Uh, as a young kid and even throughout my playing years when when I did play with him every year there was a greater amount of respect that was gained for him because of the way he led this is a guy that led by example with his work ethic both on and off the ice and uh, this is a guy that was so passionate about being the captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs in the city of Toronto and um, you know still resonates with me to this day and uh, most importantly, I mean, I, I wasn't I wasn't playing in that game for his 500th goal. I was watching from above. But even after that night, uh, you know, his he he could have went off and and you know celebrated with his friends and with his family. But he made it a priority to celebrate with his teammates. And uh, that 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 was awesome. It was a fun night. Uh, we we got to celebrate a milestone and. Um, it's just, it's too bad the way it ended for, for Matt's. He, he, like I said, he was a guy that lived and, and, and breathed blue and white and, uh, the way, uh, he was forced out of there to finish his career in, in Vancouver. Ultimately that's the business of sports. There's nothing you can do to control that. But I think if there's one thing that Matt's would have loved to do and add to his resume was to be a Stanley cup champion for the, um, for the Toronto Maple Leafs, which he fell short of a couple times, but, I think you ask any player that's played with or against him, they'll they'll sh- they share those same sentiments, and it's fun. You know, we, I I don't text message with him, but you know, every once in a while we'll run into each other, whether it's at an alumni event or you know at the ACC if he's in town and stuff, and uh, just to pick up and and just to you know f- uh, remember all those great times that we share with each other, even after he left, because he was still around after he left. Uh, those are the good, the things that you take the, with you everywhere you go and you never forget. Yeah, it was definitely a true, a true captain, right. In every sense of the word, Absolutely. And, you know, and like, he never seemed to be, um, phased by the Toronto media, right. Cause he's seen, you know, for previous players where, you know, high expectations, can you really, de- can you deliver, you know, with all the pressure of the fans and the media and everything, but he didn't seem to be bothered by all by that at all. Well, Matt's, Matt's wasn't phased by that at all. If anything, he embraced it. He loved knowing he was going to be the guy to speak on behalf of the team. 
Uh, he loved the fact that, um, you know, the, the media paid so much attention to the team because, you know, that's, that's a market that you want to be a part of as a hockey player where you're getting that attention. And Matt's was always a guy that uh, was able to um, calm things down when he needed to be calmed, whether it was in the media or in the room. He was a, a voice that everybody respected when he talked. And, um, you know, this, it's, 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 it's really a pleasure to play with guys like that because, you tend to think that, and I wish I would have played with him as I was older, right? Because I, I think I could have learned more about, um, you know, his competitive drive and how much he made guys around him better. Where a young guy in the league, you're a little starstruck in the beginning uh, because, you know, here you are, you're watching this guy, uh, you know, during during your your um, your, your younger years. And, um, but, uh, you know, I'm so happy for him. He's, he's retired now. He's got to, he, he's got to, uh, focus his life on his family and, uh, living in Sweden, but, uh, it's always nice to reminisce about Matt. That's excellent. Yeah. And Carlo, just a uh, final question for me. Uh, St. Louis was an, also another uh, place you played during your career. Uh, yeah. for those not familiar with, uh, that city, uh, the Stanley Cup champs, but those from not familiar with that market, uh, what would you say uh, best describes the St. Louis sports market? Uh, St. Louis always has uh, my greatest sports memories because I had the, my most success as an NHL player there. And um, I loved St. Louis right from the time that I got there. Really, really welcoming, uh, really um, hardworking people within the organization uh, and the city itself. Uh, great sports town very passionate uh the fans you know they're just incredible there the way they love their sports and it was so gratifying for me um last year to watch that city celebrate a stanley cup championship because even my five years there uh, we had some really good teams and that's all i envisioned is being part of that moment where um you know you get to celebrate a stanley cup with your fans and what it would look like and what it would feel like and a little bit of bittersweet for me just because, you know, it's it's a memory that I always hoped I created or was a part of. And even though I wasn't there, I felt like I was there. Uh, the, the Blues have a great alumni. Uh, I still have a lot of friends on that team. My family loved it there. Um, and ultimately, from, from top down, uh, one of the best people-run organization uh, in hockey uh, when it comes to respect and when it comes to uh, knowledge and and passion for the game, and I think it showed and it paid off. Uh, good things happen to good people, and for the city of St. Louis, the you know Doug Armstrong's done a magnificent job there, uh, building a team. And you know, people's when you build a team, people think it happens overnight. Well, you just look at the 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 phases that the the Blues have had to go through to build that team. It's taken years, and ultimately, it it finally came together. And uh, let's hope. Uh, there's a good chance that it could come together again this year because that team was uh, built uh, to go on another strong run. And uh, it's too bad they won't be doing it in, in front of their own fans, which was spectacular to watch last year, uh, watching the Enterprise Center just, you know, rocking and, um, you know, downtown St. Louis celebrating the way that they did. And St. Louis, you know, they're, 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 they they love their, 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 their sports teams. You talk about uh, the way they, they follow the St. Louis Cardinals, which – are games that I always used to love to go to in the summer times when I was there, and uh, that resonates with the with the Blues fans too. Um, and uh, so, definitely some great memories for me. Uh, a place that I hoped I would have finished my career, um, but you know, like I said, the business of sports sometimes takes you in a different directions. But uh, uh, me and my family always envisioned one day going back and possibly living there. Um, you know, and not to say that that can't still happen or will happen, but. Uh, we, we find ourselves very happy where we're at here in Toronto, settled with family and friends. And um, still, you know, Alex Petrangelo is one of my best friends. I keep in touch with him a lot. And um, if uh, if there's a chance for me to come back there, I'll definitely entertain it. So so if you had the chance of maybe coming back as like a coach or like some kind of management role, like would you be interested in doing that or like um... – I, I'm not. I would never say no to anything. I would entertain any opportunity that's uh, that that that's brought to me. It's funny you say that. I had an opportunity last year uh, to join Chris Kerber as one of the broadcast guys, and I uh, actually went in and interviewed for for the gig. And 
ultimately, um, it was a really, really tough decision. But uh, I was at a point in my life where I just wanted to find um, a way to be settled. And, you know, with me and being in Toronto, I played, you know, the last couple of years of my career, I was in eight cities in nine years, sorry, seven cities in eight years. And it just became a lot with a young family. And I'm really, really grateful to to have the job that I do here in Toronto as uh, being a, a radio broadcaster on, on TSN with First Up with Michael Landsberg. And um, I've really, I, something I never thought I'd get into, but I have so much passion for and so much love for because uh, I've always grown up watching sports, talking sports, playing sports. And uh, now I get to do that, uh, you know, on a microphone. And uh, it's been something that uh, has been so much fun and uh, less stressful than actually playing the job and, and, <laughs> and doing a job. So uh, I'm so grateful for that. So thankful for that. And so thankful for the opportunity to come back to St. Louis. But uh, things change on a year to year basis. Uh, I think I'm blessed the fact that I get to be home around my family, around my friends, something that I haven't been able to do in 18 years almost uh, throughout my playing career. So uh, thankful for that and um, thankful that I still get to you know talk sports and, and be around the game and be around uh, the hockey uh, on a daily basis and talk it and analyze it and let's just hope that uh, you know this has been a tough time to talk sports <laughs> with not much going on but we've we've yeah. grinded it out and uh, I think the, over the last couple of weeks it's been really encouraging that uh, uh, we're going to see some sports come back too soon very very soon. Yeah. Uh, before we wrap up, Carlo, uh, how can our listeners follow you on social media and yeah, awesome. uh, how can they listen to you on TSN? Yeah, so uh, I'm on Twitter at Carlo Koleakovo. I'm on Instagram at Carlo.Koleakovo. You can follow me there. I've, I, I use those uh, social feeds a lot. Um, I like to be very informative and very entertaining. Uh, but also uh, my radio show, it's at First Up 1050. Uh, we've got a podcast, uh, First Up with Landsberg and Koleakovo. Uh, you can stream us online at tsn.ca or on the TSN app. And uh, we are live on the air every day, Monday to Friday, from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern time. So you can follow us there. Excellent. Great stuff. Um, thank you so much, Carlo, for taking time uh, to join us today. Uh, wish you and your family all the best. Stay safe. Thanks. Take care. And uh, hopefully we get to do this again sometime down the road. Anytime, you guys. Uh, appreciate you reaching out. Uh, good luck to you guys. Stay safe, and uh, let's bring back sports and start talking sports again.